So what makes it important? Is there value for me? And my biggest like is, what's my role, if any, do I have to this? Especially if I'm not Hawaiian, right? Where's the connection? Why do I need to know this? If I'm not really working in a certain area, like in research or policy, why is it important to me that I have an understanding to this? So that's my burning questions. I do need a disclaimer, and the disclaimer is, my comments or my slides are really potentially seen through an indigenous worldview lens. So a little bit about me, um, I'm born and raised on Maui. I went to school at Kamehameha, I boarded, um, and I have moved back to Maui. So I live there, I commute for work, which is wonderful. Um, I have four children ranging in age from seven, a second grader to a freshman in high school. All of my children speak Hawaiian, um, they're in Kulakayo Puni, so that's a real strong motivator for me. Um, and then my husband's um, from Kauai, so his family's from Kauai, and he chose to come to the best island on Maui and live and raise our kids. So I got to give a shout out to the Maui peeps and neighbor island people because I think sometimes they get lost in the shuffle of trainings. So welcome, everyone. Oh, that's one of my questions, sorry. Who can answer for me? And so Valerie, you gotta look at who chimes in fast. What pic, where are we in that picture? Where are we? Who, where? Great, Haleakala. I hope people got it right. So what's the significance of Haleakala when we talk about health and, and, as an, and from an indigenous worldview? So we know a lot of our Polynesian cousins, especially down in Aotearoa, have that connection to the demigod Maui, right? Maui, sun, Haleakala. But also for Haleakala, it's that, it's that pico. It's the starting point for many, many Hawaiians. Many people who live on Maui have a connection to Haleakala and what it all encompasses. So for me, that's a really um, powerful start of centering who we are, understanding where we come from, you know, in, in Hawaiian culture, it's also recognizing your kupuna, where you come from, and it's also where we're going. So I don't even look at what my kupuna did for me to get me here, but how do I perpetuate that for my children forward and my grandchildren and great-grandchildren, right? So in working with the Native Hawaiian family, it's that all-encompassing, how do they connect? What is their connection? Um, and that, I, I believe, is a huge factor in working with our population. So for many of you, just a quick history of the health of our Hawaiians. So prior to colonization, epidemic free, all of those things you probably read in history books that um, especially use of traditional practices. So traditional medicine, la'au, la pa'au, um, lomi lomi, those kinds of things were mostly used during, for injuries. It wasn't about um, how do we stay healthy. Our people were very healthy. And we also know health, not only physical health. So when we look at organization of society, all of those things play into health, right? And so we know that historically our, our people were very healthy. And we know this because of our culture of excellence. When we look at the resurgence or the renaissance of, of the Hawaiian culture, we start seeing the use of feathers. How many of you um, were witness or watched um, Oha bring back Kalani Opu'u's cape? right so it's those kinds of pieces when we look at that or we go to the bishop museum and we see all these artifacts and we start to kind of go wow how did they use that how did how did hawaiians know that you could build a local ia and make it almost like your refrigerator in the ocean right that they knew based on the, the moon phases what would be the best time to plant? What would be the best activity to do? All of those pieces all add to the excellence of our culture of excellence. So we know um, we had visitors who came in um, and they brought profound changes, huge changes, um, both in health as well as within our society. Um, and, and that was kind of the start of the changing of our and challenging of our beliefs. The, the really cool thing when we talk about Hawaiian culture and our ali'i is the legacy that they really wanted to entrust to their people. And Queens here is 
a total example of that where you have the king and queen going do door to door asking for donations for this vision of help for their people because they knew that times were changing. I don't, people often ask me like, well, if, if they were still alive, what do you think they'd say? I don't know. Times are so different than when they were here. I, I really couldn't answer that. Um, but I would, I would hope that they, they knew that whatever changes were going to happen, that they had to help the community as best they could and that they knew how. So we have to look at, from their point, they were already in change and in turmoil themselves. So we know the Hawaiian population and the stat statistics um, range, but we know at the high end, um, there was about a million Hawaiians pre-contact, right? And then we know that by the, I believe 1900s, there was like 40,000. The number has totally like decimated. Um, so currently for Hawaiians, and this is taken off of the census report, there are about 560 um, Hawaiians that identify themselves as Hawaiians nationwide. So not only in Hawaii, but across the continental United States. And so here in Hawaii, if you look, or if you look at the chart, about 262,000 reside on the continental US. The rest here in Hawaii. Now, can anybody, and you can think about this, see possible changes that we may anticipate with the upcoming 2020 census. Well, let's think about this. If we're only maybe hmm, 30,000 people apart between who's here in Hawaii as well as those on the, based on those on the continent, do we anticipate potentially that the continent number will over exceed those that are here in Hawaii? Right, so that's, that's, a, that's a very strong potential. So that's why the 2020 census is really, for, for us at Papa Lokahi is really looking at how, how that impact may or may not shift. Um, not only when we look at number of people, but also policies, because policy is driven by a lot of those pieces, the census. So little history, is there any questions so far? No? Okay, so let me talk about our mo'okuauhau of Native Hawaiian health. I like using this picture of the kalo because kalo is one of those staples in our communities that brings forth life, right? Um, it's that whole cycle of haloa that it feeds us not only the, the kalo piece that we can make into pa'iai and poi and all of those things, but we can also eat the leaves, we can also grow, we can also have agriculture. It's that whole cycle of of ola, right, of what is healthy, is, is that healthy lo'i that you see there. Um, and it's also bringing together families to work the lo'i. So this picture kind of, to me, encapsulates ola, or the concept of ola. So eola mau, and I, I like doing this. How many of you folks have heard of what eola mau is? I have probably like a, a couple. Oh, come on, Dr. Akaka, you should be like, hands up, yeah. Um, and hopefully those on Zoom, both um, on the neighbor islands and here and on the continent, have heard of Eola Mau. But if you haven't, you can always Google www.papaololokahi.org and you can see the whole Eola Mau report. Well, so Eola Mau was um, an opportunity that Dr. Kekuni Blaisdell took um, back in the mid 80s, really bringing together professionals um, looking at the needs or the issues related to Native Hawaiians because so travel back right we're in 1985 or let's go back further in the 70s you have this resurgence of identity of culture of need to reconnect right as Hawaiians so you have this constitution um, convention that went on in 1978 um, Hawaiian is designated as a second language you have this growth of Hawaiian language schools in the earlys um, from Punanaleo with the help of people like Larry Kimura. So you have this resurgence and you have a champion in Dr. Blaisdell who really at the time was work walking both worlds as a medical doctor and as a really, uh, as a Kanaka knowing who he was and what he wanted for his people. He brought together um, 
individuals to really look at the health of Hawaiians. And this was really the one of the cornerstones of Native Hawaiian Health because that was the first time that we were able to come up with recommendations that things were put on the table that think about it back in 85, if you ever get a chance to look at this report, they're talking about incarceration rates, they're talking about mental illness, they're talking about substance abuse, things that we still see as prevalent today, but we're seeing it and making it black and white on this document um, 30 somewhat years ago, 30, almost 33 years ago. And so this was really a pivotal kind of game changer for our community. And the other thing is, it wasn't just about this document. Um, it was really broken up into pieces. So there was task groups. Um, and as I listed here, the historical, so really starting to look at how historical maybe trauma, right? So before the buzzword of that came up, I think looking at some of those pieces, looking at mental health, nutrition, and dental, and starting to look at the whole concept of a person. And that's really trendy if you think about it back in the mid 80s. Well, from Eolamau, we actually was birthed. Papa Olokai was birthed based on the Eolamau report and the creation of the Native Hawaiian, Native, Native Hawaiian Health Care Act. And that was done in 1988. And that actually was a policy of federal law that created Papa Olokai with the single objective of raising the health status of Native Hawaiians to its highest possible level. Now, when I read that, I think, holy smokes, that can be taken in 100, 200 different ways, right? It's pretty subjective. And, and that's the language that still remains in our current act. So let me see. Okay, so a couple of the critical findings from Eolamau uh, from 1985 was that the report found that Native Hawaiians often didn't um, go and seek medical care um, for screenings or prevention or, or any of those kinds of things that when you look at today, we see that everywhere, right? Go and get your screening, go and check your blood pressure, go and check your heart. When you turn 50, you go and do this and that. Um, back in 1985, they were finding that Hawaiians were not doing preventive screenings. Second of all, they also went to a doctor or to a medical professional later in the stages of their condition. So a lot of times these, um, these individuals were already in the stage four um, phases of cancer or further along. And oftentimes when we asked them, when they were asked, how come, why did you wait? Um, there was a, a strong belief in the community that you would go to the hospital or you would go to those places to die. There was, it wasn't seen as a place of healing and health. It was, that's where I go to die. And so it's looking at those beliefs and how those beliefs can change or should change. And then third, we found that, or the report found that there are very few Native Hawaiians in health professions. Now, so we got to look back in 1985. They were looking really at the, the standard health professional kind of um, profession. So the doctors, the nurses, those kinds of things. When we look at that today, that's a real big range, right? We're not only looking at um, medical professionals, but we're looking at community health educators, we're looking at outreach workers, we're looking at people that touch the patients that are in our community. So that, that model or the, the health worker titles have really expanded from 1985. So the other kind of interesting statistics is that at that time in 85, um, the Hawaiians were, the overall death rate was about 34% higher than the U.S. average. Now, if you scroll down those conditions and you look at the red, does one of them look kind of odd? Diabetes, and that is not a typo. So back in 85, you're talking 222% higher. That's insane. But good news, we're, we're kind of less. It's like 124 now. So, I mean, that's awesome, still junk, but at least there's some, some movement. So that's a really, you know, I, I like to use that because people go, what? And the fact that we, I think, today are much more cognizant of prevention activities, of things like that, that we still, um, for Hawaiians especially, are dealing with high um, rates of diabetes. One thing I do want to kind of throw in there, when I, when I talk with our counterparts like um, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, they they are, they are also struggling with some of these chronic conditions as well. Um, not, 
I think we're farther along um, than they are in terms of looking at how prevention can help impact, help make a difference to those chronic diseases, but to see other native populations dealing with some of the same chronic diseases. So from, and as mentioned in the previous slide, so Eola Mao actually was a cornerstone which created the Native Hawaiian Health Care Act in 88. In 92, it became the Native Hawaiian Health Care Improvement Act. So how many of you, we have five systems across the state of Hawaii. How many of you know, uh, I'm gonna just hit Oahu. How, I guess I shouldn't because it's up there. How many of you know Keola Mamo here on Oahu? Right, so Keola Mamo is the Native Hawaiian Healthcare System here on Oahu. And on the slide, I list the other areas. The unique quality about a, a system, and I'm gonna to refer to them as a system and a federally qualified health center two different um, opportunities for service for our community means very different things, right? Ultimately, the goal being to help our communities. So our systems were modeled after community health centers um, by Senator, the, the former Senator Dan Inouye. And really with the concept of getting in there and helping communities. And so I would say that if I had to choose one word or a niche to describe our systems, it would be that they are the, the fly on the wall in their community. They're really good about engaging community and understanding what is the pulse of their community, which when you look at a qualitative or, you know, this, this movement in healthcare about reimbursements and things like that for a physician or for uh, medical institutions or centers, it's how do you use that type of a model to improve your system, right? So then you have your doctors who are seeing your patients, you have your APRNs or your nurses seeing those patients, but also working with community health workers to understand how do we get anti in? How do we work with you to engage the family, to build those relationships so that they can come in for services? Because you know, if you're a nurse or a doctor, you're seeing them or a social worker, you really, your time to see them is limited. It's very prescribed where the systems can take the time and the effort to engage, which we know for our community, it might take a little longer to engage. And not only Native Hawaiian community, but we know for a lot of commu uh, marginalized communities, right? The, the piece of engagement is like 90% of the work. Once you break through and you engage, you're able to really find those gems that you're looking for to help them take hold of their health. Besides our systems, we also, um, the act also tasks us with um, overseeing the Native Point Health Scholarship Program. So this program, uh, currently the application is open until March 1st, and we scholar about 23 different professions over the last 20 something years, and I'll have a slide on that. We also um, oversee the traditional healing components, um, native Hawaiian traditional healing components, as well as research and data. And research and data is looking at research done by, for, and about Hawaiians. So if you go back to our website, tons of resources you can look at. And then data is about how do we create data sovereignty? How do we take ownership of the data we collect how we collect it and how we analyze it, and that those in our communities were analyzing and looking at it the same way. Okay. So a little bit about Papa'ola Lokahi, and as I said, it's the easiest way to describe it is the Native Hawaiian Health Board, and just a little timeline, but what people need to understand is we're government, um, we're community-based non-government entity, and we basically serve as um, the consultative body for the federal government when we talk about Hawaiian health issues. And that's really important to know. And these are all our systems. So as you can see, it's located on all the islands. And we do have Lanai and Kalau Papa on Molokai. So these are just really brief for those who are, might be zooming in. So on Kauai, Ho'olalahui is one of our systems. The kind of cool thing about this system is that they're also the federally qualified health center. So when we talk about collaboration in communities and building that partnership and really understanding what your community needed, um, it was this, it was looking at having these two, these two opportunities merge into one entity so that they can better reach their community, right? It's a small island. To have competitive um, organizations may not have fit what the community wanted or felt would benefit them. And so coming together was a really a better option. 
Keola Mamo here on Oahu, they do primary care out in uh, Kuakini and they are island wide. The nice thing with all of our systems, if you guys are, you know, yesterday I was on the Big Island and I just got to share this and um, we went to a stretching class down in Kelkaha, which is down in Hawaiian home section in Hilo side. And it was amazing. It, this free stretching workshop. And the fact that I think for a lot of our community, there's things like that that's available in their area. You don't have to be Hawaiian. Yes, that's our target population, but they take anyone from the community. So those opportunities, I think, when we're looking at those community health educators, community workers, to be able to have resources to refer their patients to is really important. Now, Pu'uvai, they cover, like I was saying, Moloka'i, Lanai, and Kalaupapa. Um, and they actually are our only system that does kupuna services. And I mean in having an adult daycare center. So they actually have a day program as well as home health, which is really interesting because once again, how they came to that, it wasn't about we have to do it. It was um, the community asking, this is a need. We have families, we have kupuna who don't want to, leave Molokai. They want to stay there. They don't want to come to Oahu with their daughter or their granddaughter. They want to stay home or they want to stay where their friends are and where they feel comfortable. And so Napu'u by working with the community developed that. And you know I, I do the caveat that I have is at the end of the day for a lot of our systems the challenge becomes how do you sustain and how do you pay for those things. So that looks at policy and how policy plays a role in those pieces, right? Hui no Kelopono is our system on Maui. And the Hui is kind of cool because like, KK, how many of you guys have been to KKV? Roots Cafe, awesome, right? Awesome, awesome. And that's what the Hui does. The Hui has a cafe there, Simply Healthy. And um, what's really quite interesting is they've now expanded into breakfast and is starting to look um, at models like Roots Cafe around how do we do that in our community and make it really community driven and community based. Because we hear that a lot, especially if you live on Oahu, you know, you don't understand because the neighbor islands do things differently. It's, it's a real different system, but really it's not. It's asking what is there that's needed? What's the gaps? And how do we help them get those gaps filled? Um, and then on the big island, we have Hui Malama Ola Na um, and they cover the whole island. Um, and they're their, I guess, claim to fame is they actually have one of, I think it's only like one or two um, approved gurney vans, transportation vans that they can use to transport people in gurneys, which I guess when I never realized that that was an issue or a need, and it really is. So for Big Island, they provide that service. And in our scholarship program, as I mentioned, we, we've awarded approximately uh, over two, $20 million over the last 20 somewhat years with the scholarship program, 23 professions, and over 270 scholars. And range from um, a doctor in public health to regular doctors, to dentists, to pharmacists, the whole gamut. And the, the, the really interesting component with this is service obligations has to be done in, in Hawaii at either a tier one or a tier two system uh, placement. So it's looking at the systems as well as the federally qualified health centers, as well as other places. So it really is the workforce pipeline. Now, how does this play into the doctor shortage? It doesn't even make a dent. And I'm gonna be perfectly honest, if our doctor shortage is substantial, this isn't making a dent in that. Um, and I believe there was an article that came out in September that there was like 769 um, shortage pukas for doctors, um, except Kauai. Kauai was the only island that didn't, at least in that report. Uh, but all of the other locations have a doctor shortage. So when we look at this, and if, if I'm a scholar in nine people, maybe only two of which are MDs, how do I, how do I effectively make a difference in the shortage? Logically, I won't, right? But we're hoping that this will give uh, a, a, at least an opportunity for those um, Native Hawaiians to give back to their communities. So traditional healing, one of the pieces of our puzzle is that we are there to support and perpetuate and, as, and actually also facilitate um, cultural integrity of Native Hawaiian traditional practices. 
And we do this primarily through our Kupuna Council. Um, this is a law that the state of Hawaii has that um, uh, I guess authorizes us to recognize councils um, of practitioners. And there's this whole um, process around that. But what it also does is keeps us connected to that piece because we know that it's a growing, growing trend. Um, and I say trend very lightly because I think it's always been there. It's just become more mainstream around the availability. Is it there? Is it not there? How do they do it? Are they um, certified? Is there licensures? All of those pieces. Is it reimbursable? All of those, I think, um, questions of 2018 come to mind and that often conflicts with those traditionalists, right? So if, um, if I was raised by my kupuna and I was chosen because I have a gift, I'm their elele, I'm their chosen one to take on this kuleana of doing lomi or doing la'au la, la la'au, it's not that I go to a three-year class, so it's not that I take, you know, I come and get my CEs and, and I do all of these tests, but it's a lifelong process that I've already been working with, with my kupuna, with her kupuna and, and all of that. And so when we talk with the, those kupuna now, it's really hard for them to understand the concept of payment and reimbursement when really this, this gift is from a kua, right? And your gift is to be given to help your people. And so it's trying to figure out where that soft spot is when we talk with traditional practitioners as well as those providers today who really want to become more mainstream. And so that's really our piece. But we also work very closely with some of those practitioners um, in the other indigenous communities up in First Nations, as well as the Alaska Natives and the, the Indian communities, because we want to know what are some of the challenges that they're facing same as us, pretty similar. Um, and, and how do we help our communities have conversations about that? Because that's really where we're at now. Okay, so research and data. So Papa Lokahi is the um, Census Information Center for Hawaii. And what that means is we basically translate census data and we send it out. The kind of cool thing with technology is you can go to www.census.gov. I believe that's what it is, census.gov. And you can do all kinds of things. But the new trendy thing that's happening is GIS mapping. How many of you have heard of that? Right, GIS mapping, where it can kind of tell you in areas what things look like, right? How many, how many health clinics do you have in a 100-mile radius? And it'll pop it all up for you. Um, and so I think there's movement. Um, one of the things when we look at census, when we look at data, you know, the buzzword several years ago was disaggregated data. We want to disaggregate the data so we can really get a clear understanding what Native Hawaiians look like. So we're not lumped in with Asians or Pacific Islanders. Not that we have anything against it, but it really will help us tell our story. Well, and now what we want to do is we want to start looking at um, data that's race-specific data. Right, so it's starting, you know, the words are changing, but really meaning the same thing. We want to collect and look at race specific data. And so then that way our, you know, the Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders can also do what they need to do with their population information. We also want to look at how data sharing happens and what data sovereignty would look like. Because if you were to get a bunch of data people in the room, they would all have different mana'o around that. And we also know that when we look at government agencies versus nonprofits versus even ali'i trusts or other organizations, we all collect data differently because we all have our own agendas and not having that be a bad word, but people wanna look what is gonna help them do the work that they're doing better. And so it's getting those people in the room to ask, how do we collectively look at data and if, for example, I'm, and, and I'm not picking on Queens, Dr. Akaka, but if Queens is going to look at how um, diabetes impacts culture and family, then maybe another organization might want to really look at how the data can impact them. Like maybe Lili Okalani Trust and working with kids and families, that might be very important to them if they're developing an IPONO workshop or an IPONO program, right? So we can look at what already is being out there and, and utilize it and have true collaboration. Now, if we want to take it a step further, this is where the collaboration gets really cool, is that 
maybe LT will say, you know what, Queens, you guys saw this, but we think it's, we think it's this. And how do we do that? Right. And so then the partnership expands the data that we're looking at, the research opportunities that we have. Right. So it's not driven by just one entity that you're starting to incorporate not only uh, a really strong um, research component, but you're looking at how community engagement and community involvement can also impact research. Because we know and I'll talk about that shortly. Um, data and how we use it is very, people get very fickle around that, right? We know agencies, especially state agencies, don't share with each other. And so data is in silos. So I could be working with ADAD. Thank you, ADAD, for the CSAC credits. Um, and ADAD will be really generous in giving us the data around opioids, right? And how, we, how can we look at this issue from a community vantage point? They give us all the data. But I might ask another department, hey, do you guys have anything around Native Hawaiians and, and um, death or infant mortality? And I might not get it because they don't necessarily share. So I think that's really important because we don't even know what the baseline is when we collect data. And so for data and research, we're trying to look at and using our Eola Maua Mau as kind of the platform to do that. And then currently we do research collaborations with JAPSOM uh, and with other community-based opportunities. I know the Ola Hawaii research team, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with our matrix, it's now kind of converting to Ola Hawaii. They're really trying to get communities to, to want to research, do research on issues that are important to them. Okay, so, i ulu no kalala ike kumu. The branches grow because the trunk of the trunk of the tree basically means the foundation, right? You build a house. If your foundation is made very poorly, what's going to happen? You're not going to have a house after a while, right? So the foundation sets the tone for everything, regardless of what you do. So when we look at families, the foundation that they come from, their beliefs, those values, all of those things are part of foundations. Those are not necessarily things you can change. But when you're working with families, those are things that you can be aware of. So your own whatever bias, beliefs, you can understand from their vantage point or their lens where they're coming from. Now, I like these pictures because is one tree healthier than the other? No, yeah, maybe one's kind of crooked. Yeah, one's crooked. Does that make it any less viable than the tall, standing straight up one? No. And so let me give you a little background. The black and white one was a tree that is on Koho'olawe. And the other one is a tree um, up in, uh, on Maui in one of the forests. And I, and I took the picture of the Koho'olawe tree because I remember going and thinking, oh my goodness, how sad, you know, so crippling. And just, you know, you go there and you stand and it's just blowing red dirt and it's just so barren and you just think, man, how can anything thrive here? How can anything survive? And then when I look, then when I really look at the picture, I'm like, but the tree survived despite, and I'm going to say, you know, fine, let's give it 50 years old. You know, was it there when they was getting bombed? Was they there when, you know, it's all, when it gets no rain or very limited rain? You know, but it still survives. So there's that sense of resiliency that somehow that foundation, however it was planted and however it rooted in, rooted in. Doesn't matter if it grew crooked, grew straight. That's just, then you kind of think about people, right? We all have different looks and things about us. And that's what makes it unique, that you cannot really judge that. But the foundation, which you cannot see, is what sets the tone. And so that's really, for, for me at POL, the foundation of Eola Mau and the work we do. Okay, so this little thing, I have, I don't know if I, the man here was, there's a video. I promise there's a video. Okay, I just have to. Mm -hmm. Can people hear? Health starts in our homes. It continues in the schools, is a part of our communities while remaining connected to the health of our land. In the Hawaiian framework of Mauliola, 
We know that when talking about health, we should also consider the health and well-being of our ohana, our community, and the aina. Mauleola balances our traditional concepts of the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health of our people. It further includes personal, social, economic, and environmental factors that influence health and well-being. These factors are also known as the determinants of health. Stress, discrimination, education, connection to culture, housing, and unemployment are all determinants of health. Our state law recognizes that all state agency planning should prioritize addressing these determinants to improve health and well-being for all, including Native Hawaiians. Let's take a closer look at how determinants of health can affect our lives and how we can support programs and policies that create positive systemic change. Meet the Kealoha Ohana, a multi-generational family living in Hawaii. Grandparents Tutu Mary and Papa James, single father Keola, and his two children, Le Ohu and Nico. Keola works long hours in his job. Keola can't afford childcare, so his mother, Tutu Mary, cares for her grandchildren after school and on the weekends. The family has limited time to eat meals together. On a budget, they typically order from the dollar menus at the fast food restaurant close to their house. We can see that this family's health has limited time for activities that promote health and well-being, such as a connection to their culture, healthy eating, and time spent with the aina. Now, picture a program or policy that can change this family's determinants of health. Tutu and Papa go to their hula halal on the weekends where they get their exercise, connect with culture, and learn about upcoming community events. Their hula halau is going on a huaka'i to learn about the local fish pond restoration and encourages them to bring their ohana. Tutu and Papa begin taking the children, Le Ohu and Liko, to the fish pond on weekends during community work days while Dad, Keola, works. They learn how to care for the health of the land and ma'alama aina, as well as to learn to build a fish and fruit drying box to take home. Le Ohu and Liko begin spending more time outdoors. They start taking walks in their neighborhood with Tutu and Papa and ask the neighbors along the way if they can pick mangoes from their trees to dry in the drying box they built. Dad Keola is encouraged by some of his Kane cousins to attend a men's wellness conference that focuses on leadership training. At the conference, he learns traditional food preparation and makes a papaku iai and pohaku. He learns about aipono and its importance to the aina and our community. Keola has a renewed connection to culture and perspective that he takes home to the family. The family starts to pound poi together on the board while incorporating pa'iai and poi into their regular diet as complex carbohydrates. The Keola family starts to share the dried mango with their neighbors who provided their access to the trees. Keola brings poi to share with coworkers at work during lunch breaks. His kids, Liko and Leohu, take dried mango to school for a birthday celebration for their classmates. These changes start to replace how often they eat at the local fast food restaurant in their neighborhood. The kids' upcoming class project will be to help build a community garden at their public elementary school. They're excited to learn about how the math and science curricula can be applied through growing their own food. These examples show how determinants of health can impact our lives and how working together, we can improve the health of individuals, families, and communities. This is at the core of the Mauliola framework working together to take care of the health of our aina. Each program is designed to produce specific health outcomes. As we saw with the Kealoha family, an intervention can have multiple outcomes, including renewed connection to culture, positive behavior change, reduction in stress, increased physical activities, increased intake of fresh fruits and vegetables, decreased chronic health conditions and their associated risk factors, fewer injuries, improved well-being and quality of life, and increased health equity and reduced health disparities. Mauliola incorporates a holistic kanaka oivi understanding of health and a healthy development throughout all stages of life by addressing community, land, and culture as well as individual health. This framework provides health equity promotion and healthy development across lifespan and establishing a community and nation where people can be healthy both now and for generations to come. For more information, go to healthypeople.gov and oha.org slash health. Okay, any questions?
questions about the video you saw? And you know, they kind of stole my thunder because when I was putting together the PowerPoint and the discussion, you kind of do that and then I'm like, oh my goodness, they have a video already. I should just show that, right? So, but that's what it is. It's as for Hawaiians, it's really defining health from our lens, right? We so often historically within our culture, we're often kind of given it, right? We're told this is how it's supposed to be. This is the framework and we're going to kind of put it over you and, and you can figure it out. And that can be with any um, community really, right? Is somebody else comes in and says, this is what we interpret it to be and this is what it is. Well, that's not that doesn't always work because we know that as a person and, and, and granted, this is not a new concept, you know, in the last, this is not something that got created in the last five years around holistic treatment of, of patients or people we work with, right? This is one of those, it's been there all along. So when we look at, a, at culturally, right, in Hawaii, when we think of the Ahapua'a system, mountain to the sea, Everybody had a specific role. Everybody worked in tandem to the things that they were good at and they did, but it encompasses everything. So up in the mountain, you were able to gather those things. Down at the ocean, they were fishing and they were providing that and having that cross sharing. And so that's the same thing when we define our health. We're looking at health, well-being in the middle or your person and all those things around it. There's many things we can, we can look at. There's a lokahi wheel. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. The Lokahi wheel talks about spirituality, all these pieces. And we know that if things are out of balance, right, it impacts your, your, your life. Things, right, if, if you're having so much stress in one area or not enough good in one, it impacts, like right? the seesaw goes off. But really, it's more than that. Um, we're not that, I guess we're not that simple. We're pretty complex because all these things roll into each other and have impact with each other. So social determinants of health, the new buzzword or buzzword right now. But if we really think about it, for when I look back at Eola Mao 1985, those, that's what the recommendations were. They were social determinants of health. We just didn't know what to call it then. Now we do. Or if we even look back further in history, the way that our communities were set up, the way that we governed ourselves, the way that we, we lived and played as, a, as, as Hawaiians, those were all social determinants of health. It's just somehow nobody came up with that buzzword. I should come up with a buzzword. I'm gonna work on that. Okay, so where are we now? What does it matter that Eolamao 1985? I wanna know 2018, like what's happening? And so I do wanna introduce Tersha Ku over there. Tersha Ku is our projects coordinator at Papa Lokahi, and she's, this is her big baby, her task. We realized that 32 years had gone by and we never really had a, like, a document update. We've done gatherings, I think in 1998, there's been milestone opportunities, but we've never reconvened and looked at the document and really started to dissect and find out where we are, where we're going. And so this was something we undertook in June of 2016. So if you guys were paying attention to when I started, yes, this was two months after I started. Um, and it's, we are like at, like, I can touch the finish line cord. That's how close we are, which is very exciting. But we reviewed the, the 1985 report. We brought together um, people to, who are experts in those areas, but also those that worked in those areas that have that passion and excitement around Native Hawaiian health. And what we did was we began meeting via Zoom and as well as in person over the last year and a half. And we're at the point in April of 2017, I'm gonna move forward. We actually submitted a sample of this. This is our sample synopsis that was submitted, um, mental health and behavioral health. And I do wanna give a shout out to both Deb Gobert and Earl Hishinuma, who are here at Queens, and Nalina Andrade. But this is really what we wanted to look at in, okay, what, are, what do we know about it? What, is, what has, really taken off? What are some approaches that are working, but also what are some approaches that we think are going to be defining this area as well? The gaps as well as the recommendations of impact. So this was really the first 
opportunity, like an executive summary of where we were over almost a year period. And this was presented to our congressional delegates in Washington, D.C., because we wanted to give them the opportunity to start looking that we were looking. I'm low back. Sorry. Sorry about that. So what we did was we kept the four original groups. We did um, initially look at breaking up nutrition and dental, but as we're kind of finalizing things, we realized that they really do tie in very well together, that what people eat and their dental health really do um, go hand in hand. And so we're debating about putting them back together. There's two areas that we added, and that was data governance and workforce development. The other one that we kind of toyed with is um, innovation. And that's another kind of cool little new word, innovation. But we realized that innovation can be integrated in all of the task groups, right? That's part, that should be part of it when we're thinking ahead, when we're thinking what has been going really well and what really maybe hasn't been going well. And so right now, so I think I mentioned this, the, Hawaii, the, the doctor shortage, right? So we, we know that. And that was in a Star Bulletin report in September of 2017 because I saw somebody who I said, Kauai wasn't, didn't have shortage and you went, Oh, really? So it's in that article, and I believe Kelly Withy folks were working on this. We also know that recently, I believe it was last year, a report came out that Native Hawaiians' life expectancy actually reduced. We're only six years younger than the national average, which is, which is great. Um, the other thing is we noted that there were very similar issues from 1985. So we thought, were there factors associated with it? If so, what? Um, especially when we look around the issues of mental health, especially. In 1985, I don't know if our communities were at the position or at the place to be comfortable talking about mental health, suicide. Um, I believe we knew about our incarceration issues, but whether we're ready to put it on the table and start really looking at it and talking about it, but also you got to think about the topics. It's not really something that we knew what, how to fix it. Right? And so a lot of times, a lot of these issues, we were, um, again, given the mold to put over us so that we could try to make a difference. But if the mold doesn't fit us, we're not going to really see much impact. Right? And so, but that's the challenge, I think, in any um, community or marginalized community is who, who, gets top, who gets top dibs? Is it Native Hawaiians? Is it um, Pacific Islanders? Is it, right? It's, there's a lot of marginalized communities. We understand that. But I think it goes back to how do we involve communities in asking them, what does that look like for you? Because if anything I've learned, um, I, I definitely don't expect what they do in Papakolea to work 100% over in Pukukalo on Maui. Maybe some concepts, some pieces might fit, but I better be willing to look at a different plan. And that's the hard thing because those adjustments have costs associated to it, right? And so how do you do that? And if the numbers, and that's the other thing, if the number of the group is small, they often will not get as much attention or benefit that the larger population would get. And then the other thing we realize is, what, what could we do different, better, change um, when we move forward with the second, the version two of Eola Mau Scar, Eola Mau Amau. What do we do better as an organization to, to track, to, to know what's out there? I think um, it's hard when, and it always goes back to resources, whatever the resources is, whether it's body power, money power, all of those things. But how do we have a post accountability plan? Meaning, not so much for communities, but for ourselves, because if we hold ourselves to a really clear standard of practice or care, then we should be coming out with really clear ideas of how do we move forward, how do we engage communities, how do we track um, progress, good or bad. So our plans for dissemination, um, we, like I showed you, we have the synopsis already. Um, our edit team will be meeting next week. Um, those reports will go back to our our groups and then come march we take it and we make it all pretty and release it um, one of the things is that you know in today's technology we can do a lot of things downloadable right that's what oha did with their mana book everything's downloadable 
So we're going to be doing that, but we also are aware we have people who like hard stuff. They want to hold the big volumes and that's okay. So we're going to have a multitude of things. So we'll have some of those quick reference things is an executive summary. We'll have the full report, everything bound, and then we'll also have pieces that are um, downloadable. And then for people who want to see the original Eolamao, it is on our website as well, both the executive summaries and the whole, the whole thing. Um, and then Tersha will be doing the roadshow in our communities to talk about what that means. Because the part, the part that excites me is that, okay, so this is all the, the data rich stuff, right? Data rich stuff. So data is collected, research is done, but what does that mean? Does anybody know what happens with all that data and all that research? It creates policy. So if we look at the slide on, I guess, your left, it's our traditional policy track, right? Bright ideas are made or come up with, whether it's, and it's often not communities, because if communities come up with ideas, normally it gets tweaked somewhere along the way. And so the, the powers, the, the think tank up here creates ideas of what they feel policy is or what is needed in their community, right? And then it's kind of like a waterfall. It goes down to the communities via an intervention. Along the way, it picks up com some cool components and buzzwords and whatever, but it comes down, right? And then intervention. So do we see that that I don't know that there's a, a potential for gaps to occur when we do that. Maybe, maybe not. So if you look at the, the integrated policy track, this is the way I think policy really should work. Not that it always does, but maybe it should. Is that great, there might be ideas from the top that go down, but there might be ideas from the bottom that go up, right? And then it's like that seesaw. And it's kind of finding, depending on who's on each side, where the center comes. Knowing that you're never gonna to get to the center right off the bat, right? Because think about playing a seesaw. You're kind of like this for a while and then you kind of lift one side and then it kind of evens out. And, but it doesn't always stay that way because somebody's legs get sore and then, or somebody gets off and then everything goes, you fall off. But the thought that an integrated policy model or a track would give communities a stronger voice as well as to have opportunities to have conversations with policymakers to really understand what's happening with our community. And that's what we're hoping Eola Mao Mao does is provide talking points and not to tell the policymakers, well, we want X amount of dollars, but what it is, is a tool to help people understand when we create interventions, however we do it, we need to kind of be mindful of concepts and communities. So, we do this Eolamao thing, and I realize that I, I can assume, and we never want to assume, I can create scenarios in my head about what is it that the community wants. We do this Eolamao, we take this research, we do this data, but what? And then I realize we should really ask our communities, right? I mean, that seems very simple in, in theory, um, but we often don't for whatever reason. And so I go back to about two years ago when I first started and we, we do a lot of things, right? And I thought, well, how do we know that that's what our community wants? How do we know what really is pressing for them when we talk about health in Native Hawaiian health? And so we did this really quick three minute pulse survey and we blasted it out. And what came back, we expected dental, chronic diseases, things like that. And what came back was communities or people were saying, we want to understand better wellness. What? what? Where did that? Wow, that wasn't even on our radar. Wellness. And that was kind of like, okay, this is really important because somehow, somewhere, we even got disconnected slightly, right? And we could find, we could justify how we can fit wellness into our pie, but if we really wanted to hear that and have interventions work, we needed to go back to our community. And so we made it a priority at PAPA that when we do these data-rich stuff, that we also kind of partner it with community voices. So this year we talked with um, our community and we're, and we're about halfway through, we talked about how does, um, 
Hawaiian knowledge impact health? What does that mean to you? What does that look like for you when we talk about traditional healing, traditional knowledge, traditional activities? Because we know, well, there's that theory out there, right? That more connected you are to your culture, the more healthier you should be. So we kind of wanted to even test, like, do people even feel connected? What does connection mean to them? So what we did, and this is only from July through November, so four months, we got about 400 surveys. Um, what we did was, it's, it seems to be more Wahine um, responses than Kane responses. And then um, we did this really cool infographics that show you where we've gotten surveys from. Right? So when, when I tie back to potentially 2020 census and what, what might happen, right? that we might see more Hawaiians on the continent, well, it's really important for us, us to ask the continent Hawaiians, well, what does that mean for you? What does um, Aina-based programming mean for you? Do you prepare food traditionally? Do you do Aina activities? Because if they're not, then we're creating opportunities like that. They, there's already a disconnect. And that's an unintentional disconnect, yeah? So that was really, um, and that's going to roll out with our Aola Maua Mau as well our final one. So when we look at health at a, at a glance, we know all this stuff, the incarceration, the addiction, all of those things that we are disparate in, no, we already know that. So I think that's one of the pieces that Eolamao looks at is that we know that. What we want is how do we um, reverse the turn back, reverse it, or move ahead with pieces in place that can help us overcome it, or at least make some kind of effort to overcome. And then, you know, it's also looking at how we, how we use um, our indigenous piece. Yeah, what does that mean for our people? And I know there's a question that we're going to get to after around Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian versus part Hawaiian, things like that. But it's also how do we put a cultural lens or cultural spin on things and really mean it, not just go, okay, we're going to be culturally competent. Uh, what does that mean? Well, you can be culturally aware, and but again, it's the buzzwords that we put on ourselves because our, our profession has that, right? So we're going to use those wonderful words. But it's beyond using, it's actually believing and doing and having it be part of your culture of where you work or how you live. So value of Native Hawaiian health initiatives, right? We all know, we build a strong lahui, it's thriving, you have kupuna, you have keiki, you have this whole thing of, of values that help them create that, have them identify what values, what beliefs they hold strong, and your job is to help provide the buffet that they can select from. You can't make them take it, but it's offering the opportunities. And then, you know, when we look at the past, we always tend to look at all the, the not so good, right? When we look at it from today's point, as we look at how do we deal with the future. But, you know, I look at the black and white picture, and what it is, is that's a picture that they took when they were going around the roadshow to, they were against annexation. And I look at this and I go, my goodness, can you imagine being the artist looking at this group of people and the passion, how impassionate they were about an issue? And then I think, well, how does that, you know, that's really important. Our past really does connect us to where we are today and what we look at for the future because hopefully we can learn some pieces that we don't make the same mistakes. And right, so when we look at the other cartoon, but you know, the bottom picture at Onipa'a, the 125th, you know, the fact that that flag rose up and I, and I can only imagine that swell of pride that the community had is those kinds of pieces that are really important to capture and to be aware of. I throw in Ruth because I just think she's just this cool kind of, entity um, in our history and just so much that she stood for she was very firm in her beliefs and what she wanted and how she wanted to do it so why do we do this why why is native Hawaiian value or wellness so important when there's so many other issues that we know happen with other marginalized communities well because for us at Papa Ololokahi that is our task our task is to raise the health and well-being of Native Hawaiians to the highest possible level. So for me, that is my kuleana. Not that I don't look at other community cultures as valid, because we can learn from each other, but really that is my ultimate priority. But also we know that 
you know, we never, it's trying to figure out how we capture the essence and meaning of being Hawaiian and what that means. Because you have people that you might work with that are Hawaiian that don't feel connected, right? So even at that basic level, what's the significance of that connection or lack of connection? To understand the value of culture and finding a voice in being advocates. And now I'm not asking you to be the, the, the voice box for Hawaiians in your community or with your patients, but to give them the tools so that they can advocate for themselves. So it's those basic universal engaging skills, right? Give them the tools, you know, pull from your toolbox to help them create those, those opportunities. I think being mindful as Hawaiians, the dual need, the dual existent issue that oftentimes they struggle with, how do I work my nine to five? How do I provide in this Western life we live, but still be true to my culture and my community and what that means? And many Hawaiians still struggle with that, right? You, you know, there's that belief that you have to give up one to get the other. And no, it's how do we help our communities dually exist? Um, I think it's also being mindful. I say eliminate cultural misappropriations, but maybe it's just being a, uh, mindful, building active awareness. And then I think I spoke to resiliency earlier when I talked about the foundation of the tree. So how do we do this? Well, it begins with you, right? Understanding relevant resources to your community, whatever community that is. But for Hawaiians, really looking at how the data, what is the data? Is the data skewed one way or the other? Is, is there enough sample to even give you a clear picture of what the research is, what the outcomes are, and then how do we truly in get integrated into the work that we do? I think it's also valuing, valuing your culture. It is. It's being good in your own skin. You don't need to be Hawaiian to work with a Hawaiian. What you need to do is understand who you are, where you come from, good, bad, values, beliefs, whatever you come with, baggage and all because that's authentic and that's what is important in working with our community is being authentic. You're not here to fix us. What you're here to do is help us figure out how we can do it ourselves. Um, I think it's also being open to learning about or using traditional practices. I think especially for the medical professionals, the doctors, right? There's that belief around fear. You don't know. You're trained in a very Western model. How does that, how does this La'al thing work? And well, maybe go and learn about it. We're not saying you're going to convert and be like prescribing la'au and sending them to the la'au, la'au, the la'au, la'au practitioner. But what you're doing is you're building your own knowledge base so that when your kupuna comes and they're like, yeah, you know, when I was growing up, um, I remember watching my grandma give me, you know, the hibiscus and did this and or the kukui oil so that you're not looking at them like, what? But that you're going, wow, that's really interesting. And then what? How did it make you feel? And so I think it's having those kinds of open conversations and being okay with it and being okay saying, you know, I, I've never heard that and, and that's okay. Um, it's also understanding your place and in in your role in working with your patients. Okay, so our next steps, because I think we're going to be wrapping up soon for questions. Well, I'm hoping, and, and I can only talk for POL, and maybe this will be these thought-provoking questions for yourself, but... How do we build a Native Hawaiian Health Task Force? Besides the scholarship, we're looking at how do we create um, hui's, networking hui's, so that if I'm a physician on Maui and I have a patient moving to Kauai, I, I will know, hey, this doctor is on Kauai, this other Native Hawaiian is on Kauai, which might be a really good fit for my patient and have that warm handoff. Or maybe not even about not Native Hawaiian practitioners, but who's out there that, even for us to educate non-native Hawaiian, non-natives, because the reality is we're not going to have enough native Hawaiian doctors to fill the shortage, right? That's just the reality of it. But if we can educate and engage and have that desire for our, our you know, non-native Hawaiian counterparts, then that can build capacity as well, right? So that's what we're hoping to do. Educate our community so they become more of an advocate and they can ask. Um, like I said, collecting and publishing detailed race data and partnering better and being okay in not, um, you know, hoarding. That it's okay. We can share our data. We can share information because then we can see what we're missing and maybe areas we want to look at. Um, partnering to engage our communities in advocating for health. We do a really great job in prevention around you know, cancer screenings, diabetes screenings, but it's also maybe engaging in health workshops, not just health in the Western framework, but other cultural activities. How do you, 
how do you make an emu, a traditional emu? And that might be like, well, that's a pretty far stretch. But if you're having a diabetic learn how to eat better, for them to actively engage in how do I do this emu? How do I prepare a food? Maybe I can learn how to steam the kalo or the uwala or these other foods in a very different way. And to understand and feel more connected like the video showed, those are things we can do. I think it's also working along other um, Native Hawaiian organizations and being okay that we can share and that we can share like, you know, it's like, okay, and, and maybe this is not PC, but it's like when you think about you're, you're, you're in a changing room, you're trying on an outfit, you're your worst critic, correct? You're over there going, oh my gosh, this is too tight. Or, uh, and you never come out of the dressing room. But I bet you if you came out nine out of 10 times, somebody goes, wow, that's a really nice dress on you. And you're like, what, really? And that's the thing is, as Native Hawaiian organizations, we never, we're so fearful that somebody is going to judge us or look at us and go, oh, you didn't do enough. You didn't do this. And it's, it's okay. That's where I think strength in numbers come really well with our communities. And then also provide opportunities, really out of the box opportunities through internships and program supports. Yeah. So it, for me, I think it's great to engage high schoolers. I think we need and this is my opinion, I think we got to start engaging at the elementary because I find that these kids are very aware of what's going on, right? They know. And so to start planting those seeds, because by intermediate and high school, I think the likelihood of really catching them and engaging them, unless they're already there, is, is much more challenging, right? And that's when you get the family. Family still, and I talk from experience, when you have younger children, right, you all flock to watch them perform when they're like in preschool or in elementary you're like oh snapping snapping cameras all wonderful by the time they get to intermediate you're like what you have another performance okay yes yes we're there but you know the excitement goes down so I think it's looking at those opportunities outside the box and then what I wanted to share before I wrap up this is actually a collaboration model that really is out of the box so it's 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 the the consortium is called Nalimahana Olono Puha, and those are all the founding organizations that created this consortium, really looking at it from a collaborative partnership, true partnership. And, and it's pretty interesting because it has kind of the vast uh, medical institution from an education institution, health, uh, qualified health centers, you know, it, it's the gamut. And I think that's where the direction that we need to go that we need to ask for help and it's okay that we all come together and have those conversations and then you know as leaders we don't we don't create followers we create more leaders so even when you look at the work that you do you might not be a manager or a supervisor but you're leading you're setting by example right you're you're working with your patients and you're hoping something sticks and that's what it is is how do i get you to want to lead and and not just follow me because I tell you that's the way you're supposed to do it. That's how we create engagement and, and advocates of our clients. And that's me. Okay, so last question. Anybody know where that is? Close, it's not on Oahu, how about that? <laughs> Maui, yes, I'm gonna give you that. It's in Hamoa, in Hana. So, um, you know, it's one of those things to just, you know, be aware of what's around you, right? How do you find value in the things that are around you and what you do? So thank you again for the invite, Valerie, and thank you for those who sat through this and those on Zoom. And if we have any questions, I think we have a few minutes. Yeah, I have three online. Thank you so much, Sherry. That was wonderful. Um, so there was a one just recently about your survey. Who are you sending the survey to? I live in Hawaiian homestead, enrolled in OHA, but never seen a Papalokahi survey. And then where are you in the same person? Where, oh, sorry. When and where are your road shows expected in the community? Okay, so um, I don't know which Hawaiian homes you're at. Um, what we can do is get it out. We've been working with the Shaw, the Homesteaders Association, to get those surveys out. 
Um, we have done some road shows at the Hawaiian Civic Clubs. Um, we've been focusing um, on Oahu. We're going to be heading out to the neighbor islands. But the rollout of Eola Mau on the road shows, I believe if you're on Maui, that's going to be, well, Molokai is in April. I know that for sure. I think we're trying to look at Maui shortly thereafter. And then Molokai and Big Island haven't been confirmed, but all of these have to be done before by the end of June. That's our goal. Okay. That was from Trudy. And this one is from Anita. For data purpose, is there a consensus what is Native Hawaiian or part Native Hawaiian? So... <laughs> Probably not. I, I, um, the census has the box, Native Hawaiian, Hawaiian. And my understanding from the census is part of the reason for that box is because there's still people who are, are Hawaiian, are, are Native, are pure Hawaiian, lack of a better word. Um, but there has been discussions in different schools around, why don't we just say Hawaiians? Um, and that's true. I mean, I think that is a very realistic discussion. The, the challenge is going to be, how do we get everybody to change their forms? That's going to be the challenge. I think it took a lot to get people to move away from uh, Hawaiian, and, Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. So it's, we know that there's going to be some challenge around that. There has been some, some schools who have come to the table saying, maybe it's not even about being um, Hawaiian label, but maybe it's Kanaka. Because when we look at research, previous to contact, a lot of the newspaper, a lot of the writings that were done um, were described them as Kanaka. So, you know, that's also another discussion is maybe that's what it is, is they're Kanaka. Hawaiians were kind of, again, raised, right, because we live in Hawaii. So I, I think that's going to be a very um, interesting dialogue and question. And then it also poses to asking communities, what does that mean for you to be labeled Native Hawaiian versus part Hawaiian versus Hawaiian versus Kanaka? Right. And so I think it's going to elicit a lot of emotion because I think anything to do with Hawaiians elicits emotion. It's a very, very emotionally charged conversation. So, anyway. Okay. And then a question from Joseph uh, about Mi'ihau. Uh, the data you provided regarding Native Hawaiian health concern, does it include the isolated community of Mi'ihau? Also, is there a program and system in Kauai? Uh, Hawaii, yes, mentioned extending to Ni'ihau population. Thank you. Yes, so Joseph, for your question, um, on Ni'ihau, we do not have anybody that goes on to Ni'ihau directly, but um, Ho'olala Hui has a clinic out in Waimea, and Waimea really is the hub of that community to come in, and so that's where our tie-in for the Ni'ihau community comes, it's through the Waimea clinic. And then Miles had a comment. Race and by implication, uh, her uh, heredity and genetics data may not really be the correct factor. Ethnicity may be better as it ties to cultural preferences for food and diet and activities, family having similar illnesses, less due to her heredity, more because they tend to eat the same things and participate in the same activities. So, so it was I'm just a comment. So I'm going to um, assume that that was based on the collecting race-specific data. Yes. Um, and that is kind of, right, it's the, it's the buzzwords. So that's kind of the new verbiage that's coming out from a lot of these data folks um, around that, 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 I don't know if that's commonly used as more so that's something that they're wanting to use, kind of like that disaggregated data that's very commonly used. That's kind of the new terminology that they're proposing. Yes, and then the woman that asked about Hawaiian Native Hawaiian Trudy, she said, I'm in Waimanalo, so do you have a listing on your website? Uh, so uh, we, I can answer, we can answer Trudy afterwards. Okay. Jennifer, is there a program where a licensed a health professional able to apply for a loan replacement if they work in Native Hawaiian health care system such as Waianae Comp? Uh, I believe so. There's a there's a loan repayment plan. I'm not sure if the organization she works with is is signed up, but I know there was an article on the Big Island where um, their group of profession of providers got recognition for that loan repayment. I know that um, Napuuvai over on Molokai does is part of that um, opportunity for those medical professionals there. Wait, wait. 
Thanks, Kathy. You're welcome. So um, within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, there's the um, National Health Service Corps Loan Repayment Program. Um, and so it needs to be in a health profession shortage area. And then also the state of Hawaii has its own loan repayment program. Um, so depending upon the program, different professionals um, are eligible. Yeah. So check yes. out um, HRSA, HRSA, and National Health Service Corps. Thank you, Kathy. And I think there was a question up here. Yes. Margaret, nice to see you. Hi. This is such an honor to be in the presence of this presentation. Um, so my knowledge of health and healing comes from the field of behavioral health, but also physical health. And from where I'm sitting, the, whole, the what Papa's done and the, Hawaiian, the Native, Native of Hawaiian health system is a gift. Yes. Because it manifests what health can be if you understand the, the deeply felt soul needs of a people who have been displaced. And just, I'm kind of new, so I think I can say this and it's okay, but there's many other ethnicities who, who came to the islands as indentured servants who started out as being displaced, not in the same way that the Native Hawaiians, but with a, in a similar, yeah, level. So I'm wondering what if, my sense is that you have something to give, a lot to give, to offer to all the other health systems and the social services agencies and the jails and the foster care system and all of the systems that, that address the needs of people that are vulnerable about what people really need in order to connect with their, their, their strengths and their hopes and their sense of the future. And I'm wondering if maybe the FQHCs kind of operate under the same principles as you guys. Did they, do you guys ever work together to share practices? So there, you know, I think, and I'm sure people are gonna like it's recorded, so oh well. I think sometimes personalities get in the way and I, and I don't think it's, it's new to the field here. Um, and so that plays a role in it. I think resource allocations play a role in it because People think if we if we partner, I'm going to lose something and you're going to gain something. And a lot of times it's money, right? It's money. And unfortunately, however, the systems are created to fund programming, to reimburse for services. It's very competitive. And I don't I mean, I want to believe that that's not their intent to make it so competitive that people get very protective of their assets and exclude others. Um, but we know that there are organizations such as KKV with Dave DeRoff folks who are more than open with what they're doing um, on Maui. And, and I can say this, I was at a meeting with the um, executive director from the Federally Qualified Health Center and our system, and they were able to start having di dialogue about maybe even share like doing a referral doing an mou with each other which they kind of laughed it off that you know they've been in existence separately for like 20 something years but never partnered now that just sounds bizarre like how does that work you're a mile apart from each other you guys see each other needings why not but i, I think a lot of it is in unintentionally we're we're programmed that when we look for grants we look for monies right we're, we're competing and it shouldn't be because who suffers is the communities, unfortunately. And so I think we, we got to look at personality because sometimes you just can't get past the personalities and, and that's okay. But I also think it has to be a, a, a really, an integrated belief in your organization. You cannot just say I'm culturally competent. I can't, you cannot just say in a grant that we're going to do cultural activities for an hour every two months. Know that if you truly value being inclusive, if you truly value the beliefs of communities, then those are the values that your organization will have and display. So kind of like people, I cannot, I personally cannot help people gain aloha. Nobody can do that. I cannot, I cannot give you aloha. I cannot teach you aloha. But what I can do is the aloha that you have, I can help you figure out how to better utilize it in the communities in which you work. And that's the other thing is, you know, being Hawaiian, it's never about myself. It really isn't. It's about the community. But my actions is what pushes forward, right? So it's never about what am I going to gain from it. It's about how is my community going to thrive better if I, if I suck up my ego and pride and work there. Now, but it's also saying and being okay in stepping away. 
if it's not working for your community, then to step away. But that's a hard thing because communities get attached to the money and the, the services that, that potentially could be available, right? So you kind of get sucked into that inadvertently. But it's also the state, you know, our government has to really take ownership about the values and what we say we have to do. And so if you're wanting to do a cultural thing, then we should be seeing cultural task forces. We should be seeing how you behave in your nine to five in your courthouse should be what is being displayed. And I think we're seeing based on technology and, and just instant gratification, we see things on live video and live streaming, right? So things aren't um, delayed for people. They see it. And then, like I said, it's very emotionally charged whatever the issue is. If it's dealing with culture, it's emotional. And thank you for both of those comments. It's a wonderful ending. We're about five minutes over, but we want to thank Sherry for her thank wonderful, you. professional, help, heartfelt presentation. It was one. Thank you. And we will close. And if you want to talk to Sherry some more, I'm sure she's and her staff willing to talk to you. And thank you, everybody online, for uh, being there and your comments.